All right, so I'm Ryan, otherwise known as a man of his music, and today I'm going to do my Tunes Tag 2023, or the Jazz Vinyl Tag, created by none other than Chris from Tunes from the Man Cave. So big thanks to him. He's actually the one that got me started last year uh, with the Tunes Tag, and it's definitely something I never expected that, you know, I'd do, but I fell in love with it, you know, making videos, talking about jazz online. Uh, around me, there's not many people that listen to jazz, so it's definitely, you know, it's a, it's a great change of pace to... Uh, talk to a lot of people and communicate, make friends with people who, you know, listen to the same music that I do. So I definitely encourage anybody out there, you know, if you have a strong passion for jazz, but you don't have a YouTube channel, you don't know too many people who listen to jazz, uh, if you're willing, maybe you can make a YouTube video. And I'm sure, you know, tons of people will comment, appreciate it. Uh, and I'm sure you'll make some friends too. So anyway, I got the 10 questions here. Like I said, created by Chris. So the first one is going to be my favorite find of the year, which is the Delaware Heritage Concert uh, by the Black Star Ensemble, which is, this is actually like a Clifford Brown Festival um, concert from the early 70s. I think it's like 73. But the reason that I wanted this is not for most of the music on here. It's actually for Clifford Brown's first recording on here, which came off of an acetate created by his teacher, Robert Lowry. And the song that he did was Orthonology by Charlie Parker. So this is a private pressing. Um, I really wanted this for sentimental value, probably, um, but also because, you know, Clifford Brown, one of my favorite trumpeters of all time, but this is probably recorded about a half an hour away from me, um, maybe half an hour to an hour, but I just really wanted it. I'm from Delaware. I had to have it. I lost too many auctions, so I just had to, you know, I just had to pay up for it, and that's what I did, and um, just really happy to own this. There's definitely not many out there. I probably see like five to 10 go up on eBay and Discogs um, a year, but I would definitely get this before it runs dry because like I said, this is a private pressing and there's not many out there left. So um, I think there was like a limited number. I think it was like 300 or 500, I'm not too sure. Uh, there's There really is no way to tell. So anyway, the second question is my first jazz record that I fell in love with which is Coltrane Live at Berlin. Um, this is probably the first Coltrane record that I got. Um, this is not this one right here is not the first Coltrane record I got, um, but the 75 reissue with the green label on Impulse was my uh, first Coltrane record I ever got. And I fell in love with it as soon as I dropped the needle, Afro Blue, uh, just an amazing song. Something I, you know, there's nothing out there like it. Um, I mean, there definitely is, but in terms of, you know, if you go to a flea market, you're not gonna find anything like this usually. So I ended up finding one. I found it, like I said, it was a green label on Impulse and it was kind of beat up, but I took it home, played it, just everything about it I fell in love with. Um, Alabama, a great song, but my favorite song on there is I Wanna Talk About You. Definitely my favorite version across, you know, all singers, all artists. Um, even Coltrane, because he also had that other version of I Want to Talk About You on his uh, prestige album on Soul Train. So my favorite record of all time, I featured this in my like top 10 uh, favorite records, but this is my original mono pressing, uh, VG Plus all around. I had to have a v VG Plus condition record for this. Um, just something I love. I maybe... My grail, like the my dream record, would probably probably be a promo of this, but I'll probably I'll probably never touch that. So then my second, I mean the third question is the most far out jazz record in my collection. Um, I would say this is my most far out jazz record. Uh, Albert Eiler, New Grass. Um, there definitely is. You know, there's a lot more that I could choose from, like Interstellar Space or Stellar Regions or something like that by Coltrane. But I think this whole approach that Albert Eiler had to the genre of jazz, it's unlike any other. It's not even like Ornette Coleman um, or Don Cherry or anybody like that. It, it's its own thing. There's nobody like Albert Eiler. And I think Albert Eiler knew that. And that's why, you know, he made the decisions that he made. Um, you know, to go overseas, nobody really appreciated his music. And then he also, he had a sad story. He died, um, I think in his mid thirties, uh, he was found in the river in San Francisco, I think. 
and it was like unconfirmed whether you know if it, if it was a suicide but um i'm not too sure and i don't really want to talk about it or think about it honestly uh, albert eiler is just an amazing amazing artist um i wish he could have got a lot more love you listen to some of his interviews uh he definitely he sounds like a sad and kind of troubled guy but this album new grass has a really different approach to most music from you know the early 70s or late 60s uh the the first song is called like i think it's like a speech or it says message from albert eiler it's like a vocal and he's like i think it's like a poem of some sort but the music that goes along with that is definitely you know way out like not even is past the avant-garde but uh some of the other songs in this on this album definitely have you know maybe like a soul kind of approach but they still have that albert eiler touch that you know still makes it far out in its own way so that's why i decided to include this um this is my only albert eiler record um there's definitely a lot more out there that i'd like to have but um personally i can't afford them so anyway the next one is a uh, record from a lesser known jazz label. So here I have a Elvin Jones live album at the town hall. Uh, this is actually a memorial concert for John Coltrane. And I honestly thought this was a bootleg, but it's not, it's on, um, I think it's, yeah, it's just PM records. So I, one day I just went on Discogs going through some of my releases and I decided to look at the releases for, you know, this in my head bootleg label. But I went on there, and it's a real label. There's a lot of releases for it. So uh, it definitely was pretty cool to find. You know, I found a honey hole just on that label page on Discogs of cool releases, uh, even more Elvin Jones albums, like um, I think like On the Mountain, or I can't really recall what it what the title of that one was. But really happy to have this, especially because it's a John Coltrane Memorial Concert. I think Frank Foster is on here. Yeah, Elvin Jones, Frank Foster, Chick Corea. Uh, Gene Perla and Joe Farrell, but uh, I'm mainly here for Elvin Jones and Frank Foster All right, so my next one is An artist only released as a session leader um, So this is the only I mean you could argue that uh, John Gilmore had you know more albums as a leader because of his you know his Sun Ra discography but in my opinion, I don't think he led those. I think, you know, Sun Ra, the way Sun Ra was, I think he led most of his, you know, his own recording sessions. And uh, at least John Gilmore didn't have anything really under his name. Um, but this was co-led by Clifford Jordan and John Gilmore. And it's a um, 45 RPM uh, reissue from Analog Productions, like the early 2000s. Maybe it was like 2010s. Um, I'm not too sure. But either way, I'm just really happy to have this. Um, I, I'll never touch an original. So um, great music too. But the fact that it's a 45, it kind of keeps me, I stray away from spinning it just because it's kind of a hassle to get up and, you know, flip the disc and uh, put the other disc on. I'd kind of just like that, the 33, uh, the physicality of a 33 record. You just put it on, play it uh, half an hour. Or, I mean, not half an hour, but like close to half an hour on each side. So Anyway, the next one is a major artist release on a smaller label. So here I have Dexter Blues Hot and Cool on uh, the Do Tone label. This is a reissue from the early 70s. I actually came into contact with uh, early 50s pressing of this. It wasn't an OG on the red transparent vinyl, but it was actually like a second pressing on the black vinyl, but the cover was torn to shreds. And the guy that uh, had it didn't want to sell it to me because he thought the cover was cool, but I think that, you know, if he didn't think the cover was cool, I could have got it for a sweet deal. But either way, uh, I got this reissue now. And it's on Dewtone, like I said, which I don't know of too many other records that were on Dewtone. So uh, this is definitely the only one that I'll probably ever want or have. So Dexter Blue's Hot and Cool. And then the next one is Favorite Early Morning Jazz Album. Um, You know... Being my age, I usually wake up uh, a little later, you know, not 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. I probably wake up uh, 9, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on some days, especially on the weekend. And uh, the record I usually spin is Woody Shaw, The Moon Train. 
Um, one of my favorite records of all time. It's becoming one of my favorite records of all time. But when I got it, I actually didn't know uh, anything about it. I knew who Woody Shaw was, but um, you don't hear a lot of Woody Shaw songs, um, especially on streaming services, because his music is like the way that his estate has it set up. It's all in an app and you have to pay a subscription uh, payment, like monthly payment or something like that. Um, and it just sucks because he's got some great songs, great stuff out there. And most people don't even know who he is just for the fact that, you know, I mean, at least my age, if you're not collecting vinyl, you probably don't know who Woody Shaw is. Like I said, just because of all his stuff being on an app and you have to do a paid subscription, which I think, you know, it's BS. But anyway, The Moon Train, great record, uh, great lineup. Cecil McBee is on here. Uh, I think George Cables is on here too as well. Or maybe not. Yeah, George Cables isn't on here. Um, Woody Shaw, Azar Lawrence, um, Buster Williams, Cecil McBee, they switch off on bass. Um, and then some other names that I'm not too familiar with. And this is on Muse Records. This was actually my first uh, record that I got on Muse Records. So, And then I also have another record on Muse Records that I'm playing right now called uh, Rebirth by Earl and Carl Grubbs. Um, I probably would have put this, you know, in here because um, this is something I switched between. They both have similar sounds, uh, be, even because they're on Muse. I mean, I don't I don't really know too much on that. I mean, I guess Buster Williams is on here. And I think another guy that's on this album is also on uh, The Moon Train. But this is another record that I just spin all the time throughout the day. All right, so the next one is Favorite Late Night Jazz Album which I picked John Coltrane's Stellar Regents. Um, I can't think of a time when I haven't spun this at night. Um, usually 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I mean, you could even say the morning. It could probably swap with the Woody Shaw. I think Chris also had some that um, he could swap between. But I love this record. I love this point in Coltrane's career. In my opinion, it's the highest that he ever got. Um, even though Interstellar Space came out a little bit after that, I mean, it was recorded a little bit after that. It wasn't released a little bit after that because this came out years and years and years later. I mean, this was the 90s that this came out. Um, not even really on vinyl. It was more of like a CD release. But I just love it. I can't get enough of it. Um, there's definitely some more stuff out there in terms of things that they could release. Um, but this is probably my favorite. That's, you know, the unreleased stuff that came out of his uh, discography. So really happy to have this on vinyl because I thought for the longest time I'd probably get this on CD. But I picked this up on vinyl last year and I paid around $100 for it, which I think is worth it given the fact that the vinyl, uh, the record is kind of rare. So next one is uh, Jazz Album That Inspires You, which... I couldn't think of anything else except this Lee Morgan's volume three. This is a Japan promo that I got like shipped over here probably four or five months ago. And prior to that, I never thought I'd own a copy. I was trying to settle for a United Artists pressing, but I kind of got tired of that because um, at that point, like four or five months ago, uh, those pressings were going for like close to maybe $200, maybe like 150, somewhere around there. But I wasn't ready to pay that for United Artists Pressing. Um, although this is a legendary album, um, but why I put it here for, you know, inspiration, uh, I'd say because most of these songs, they just reek like new beginnings, uh, a fresh start. Um, it's like tomorrow's like the first day of the rest of your life. That's what it feels like if you could, if this album had like one statement to it. Um, I just, I love it. Um, I don't really play it too much on vinyl, to be honest. It's more something that I play throughout the day, like I stream it or listen to it on the way to college or something. But it's definitely one of my favorite albums of all time. Every track is a 10 out of 10. Um, no skips, nothing like that. Um, like you got, I remember Clifford. Uh, Masabi Chant, Tiptoeing. I definitely favor the alternate takes, which is probably another reason why I don't listen to this, you know, on vinyl a lot. Then you got Hassan's Dream and Domingo. But 
Um, I think this album wouldn't be as good as, as it is without Gigi Grice, because I think Gigi Grice and Lee Morgan, I think they're a perfect combination. Um, you also have Benny Golson here, but I think the combination of Gigi Grice and Lee Morgan, it's, you know, it's something that you don't really hear too often, um, really at all, honestly. So it's definitely, you know, one of the reasons why I love this album is because that sound that they make, it's like, it mixes so well but I just, I just love this record. So anyway, the last one is a jazz album with great music, but has a boring cover. So this is a pretty easy one too. Uh, Mainstream 1958 on Savoy. This looks like some type of, you know, compilation or something that came out in the seventies or, you know, mid sixties that doesn't really have anything on it, but Mainstream 1958 is a hell of a record. Uh, one that's overlooked, especially within that, um, the albums that Wilbur Harden did on Savoy and the ones that, you know, Tommy Flanagan and Coltrane and Curtis Fuller also appeared on. But Curtis Fuller actually isn't on this. It's like one less. So it's Wilbur Harden, John Coltrane, Tommy Flanagan, Doug Watkins, and then uh, Lewis Hayes, who I think only appears on like some of the tracks. But original, deep groove, mono. I got this from Strictly Hetty's. Um, I was really just ready for this. I was trying to get the Coltrane, Wilbur Harden records, uh, more so Wilbur Harden records, because there's not a lot of Wilbur Harden out there, and I I love his playing. Um, like I said, there's nothing really to go to other than his few albums that he did for Savoy, and then some of his appearances that he made on uh, Prestige, like with, um, uh, I can't remember some of the albums that he did, but I know that he made some appearances on a, a prestige so anyway that's it um i kind of i probably could have done like another 10 questions or so i probably i could talk forever honestly um although last year i probably you know could have only done like five questions really but anyway i thank everybody for watching um again i definitely encourage anybody out there who doesn't have a youtube channel but has a strong passion for jazz uh, definitely start out with making a tunes tag video because uh, these questions are set up for the beginner, you know, to get started on YouTube. So it's definitely, um, it's good for the beginner, but it's also good for, you know, the collector who, you know, who has experience. It's definitely cool to, you know, take a little bit of time and just pull some of the records out to uh, go along with some of these questions.